1046. Okay. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Um, our first speaker today is Edward Bertrand from the University of Hawaii. And we see his time with recent progress on an old unsolved problem in Hawaii. So, you all already have the background of reading the blurb under my name, so I won't go through the, that part. But uh, what we need to do first is to get some background, and I apologize to people who already know all this, but I would rather give you some hints about what I'm talking about. I've never been there. So K of G will always be in the number of consciousness classes. I'm going to find a group. The G class, bracket X, sub G, means I'm conjugating by all elements from the group G. And so I call it bracket G, that's the consciousness class. These things partition the group, I think you all know that from whatever. And the center is a set of all elements, so when you conjugate them, you come back to itself. So center is a set of all things that commute with everything. The G class is partition G. And of course, there are Z one element classes, so I just size of Z, size of class one, and X classes as they go up, and then the elf class is K minus Z class. The centralizer, everybody knows now that I already said what that is, the subgroup of elements which commute with X. Fortunately for group theory, this is true. Without this, there's no group theory. And I rely on this, and every group theorist relies on this tremendously. Okay, so what I do is uh, I take that, one, that equation under number one, I divide it by the size of the group, and you can see what I'm getting here based on this. I'm getting one equals one over g mod z plus uh, one over the centralizer of the first element of the first class and so on. And so you get the Egyptian fraction, and this is where the story started with Landau and Frobenius way back, before 1900, actually into 1900. And I have an example down here because everybody likes the symmetric group here. So I have an example of the symmetric group on four elements. You know its size is 24. It has trivial center. Here's its decomposition into the class sizes, 1, 3, 6, 6, 8. And that is, I only divide by 24, I get this. Now, the number of classes is five. I think most of you have been through something like this before. The problem that was asked, what Landau did was he looked at this Egyptian fraction equation, and Landau proved that if you give k a fix, then only finitely many groups can have k classes. So the order of the group had to be less than some function of k, and what, what they found was I guess it was Erdős, but people had done it before. So, uh, using these so-called Sylvester numbers, uh, that k, uh, the order of the group was less than two to the two to the k. Well, that's quite far off. So, fundamental problem for group theory of this type after this is to improve that. So that's where we are. Here's a few inequalities. by the number theorist Gallagher, who is also a group theorist in some sense, but has some very fundamental inequalities. So the first one you see there is, by the way, that means subgroup. And the next one means normal subgroup. That's the usual terminology. Gallagher in the 1970s proved this. K of G times G is greater than equal to K of H times H. And also, these are just a few of the things. If N is a normal subgroup of G, then K of G is less than or equal to the number of classes of N and the number of classes of the factor of G mod n. So uh, I want to point out something that I could put a little g here, right here. I could put a little g. The g classes, it would work, but I don't need it. And that's another inequality, but sharpening this one. So 
When I write P of n, what it means is I'm conjugating by elements of n. I'm not conjugating anymore by elements you know, all over the place. It means what, what, what the definition Now the next one I'm writing here, K of G over G is no more than K of n over n times K of G mod n over G mod n. That's a very important inequality to what I'm going to say. Okay? Because that on the left is going to, is going to entice you a little bit. This K of, K of the group over the size of the group is very important. And so if you can remember this, I might come back to it and show it, but if you can remember this, K of G over G is no more than K of N over N times K of G over mod N over G mod N. And then I talk about it being normal, and then I talk about the alternating group, subgroup of the symmetric group has four classes. And I make a comment here, the class of size A in the symmetric group has just split into two alternating group classes, each of size four. That's more or less what happened there. And you can see the Egyptian fraction equation up there for the alternating group. So, so far we're just doing basic group theory and what it implies. There's nothing fancy about these theorems. There's nothing but counting involved. There's no uh, representation theory or anything. Cartwright proved the following. That will turn out to be extremely important. And for Alexander, I want to point out something here. This is an inequality that's extremely important throughout the entire study of all the group theorists on this subject. What I accidented upon was this in 1991, that there's equality in this, if and only if. Now, see, it looks like, well, you'd have a little trouble with equality because here's a fraction, and here's two integers. So it wasn't clear to me, how can you get equality? Well, it happens, and it happens infinitely often. And there's equality in A, if and only if G is a Frobenius group. I apologize for not being able to define that. That will take me the rest of the hour, 20 minutes. If and only if G is a Frobenius group with Pernal N. That is probably not well known, even though it's this old. That helps a lot. And study this. Okay, so now there's some motivation. Erdős and Strauss in 1975, that's some of my connection with Krishna. Uh, I went on sabbatical in 1975. Erdős and Strauss had a seminar, Krishna walked in, and the rest is history. At that, during that year, 75, they wrote this, they had a paper published, they wrote it before. So here's the thing. The probability that two elements chosen at random from this group with replacement, so you draw your place, you draw the second one, you replace. The probability that they commute is exactly K of G over G. So if you're a good, good listener and you remember that what I told you to remember before, the K of G mod N, excuse me, K of G over G is less than or equal to K of N over N, K of G mod N over G mod N, what you have here is that the factor group is more abelian than the group. Because the probability of two elements drawn at random is higher in the factor group. I can go back to that, but I don't want to now. I'll talk about it later. But the total number of such commuting ordered pairs, and I'm giving you a proof now, and what was interesting is that Winnie Lee had something converging in her, in her uh, talk to K of G over G, and I asked her if she knew what it meant, what, what, and she didn't, and so I, I, I showed her this proof. Very simple proof. So if you want to count the number of commuting ordered pairs, drawn at random with replacement, set of pairs, X and G and Y, commute some X, all that. And yes, you can have duplication, it's okay. So you count number of ordered pairs, you pick an X and G, you look at it centralized, and you go through all the elements of G and you add them up. And now, because of that famous, well, no, we're just counting, every element in the same class as X has the same size, not the same, uh, not the same centralizer, the same size centralizer. So I just, now sum over the distinct classes, the size of the class times the size of the centralizer, you know the, set, the main thing I told you before, 
was the product of those two in that summation is the size of g. Factor out g, count one, k times, or g times k of g. Now divide by the total number of ordered pairs. So you get this over k of g over g. Very simple. It's very simple. And a lot of people are writing about it. And the big thing is when I show you another diagram. Now let's see, I have something down here. Maybe I repeated myself. Yeah, I, I, I'm now repeating myself. K of G mod N is more of more abelian. Because when I divide out by G mod N, I put an N here, I put a G mod N here, and I put a G here. This probability is less than or equal to K of N over N, of course, is no more than one. The number of consciousness classes is root can be no more than the size of the group box. And this is no more than one when I divide by n. This is k of g mod n over the size of the group. So, so that's Gallagher's inequality. He did a bunch of things. He's a number theorist and he's known to number theory people. But I knew him in Hawaii as a group theorist. Now some examples. Where am I in time? I need to know. I have to what, 157? No. Uh, 205. Thank you. Okay, so here's some asymptotic bounds just to get some examples. I know I should write a partition function, which is the number of classes in a symmetric group. I should write it out. The, uh, the size of g, of course, is n factorial, but I, I didn't want to write out p of n exactly because that's not my point. My point is, where is p of n, the number of, of partitions of n, with respect to n factorial? There is a, an approximation that I want. I know you can get it exactly, but I'm not interested in that right now. I'm interested in these approximations because you'll see the log g plays an important role. You'll see the g, o, g to the 1 over log log g plays an important role. In this the alternating group, you might guess, is half the symmetric group. So it might it must be half, about, about half the number of classes. But that's not exact. You can look that up. Here's a, here's a nilpotent group, the CLP subgroup of the symmetric group of P of the n elements. It's more than g to the 1 minus epsilon. It's very nice. It says that's quite, quite a billion. And then the Hegel group is, the probability is one-fourth. So, in this one, the general linear group is what you'll see here. So you get quite a variety. These are not, these are not easy things to prove at all. I'm just quoting on the here. PSL. G to one-third will come up very, very often in this subject. So, now this was very hard. I mean, multiple authors worked on this one, the unit tri uh, triangle matrices over just 0, 1, 0, 1, 3. But it's no more than g to the epsilon. So you, you see the range that you're getting here. It's very hard to study this. And I want to move along here and give credit to the people who have spent the last dead gut century studying the class number. And here's where we are, and I asked them, would it be possible to just get 15. So we have the number of classes, and all I've done here is write the largest group with that many classes. Here's how the size of it. And the largest solvable group. Because I'm interested in splitting the solvable groups away from the non solvable groups. So you have, you have quite a range. I'll tell you what the star is in a minute. But you see, there's something I want you to notice, and that is if you take 2 to the 6, you get something less than 72. And if you take 2 to the 8, you get something less than 600. Uh, and, and in fact, I've got 300 there, too. <coughs> okay. Now, you see the, the Fs that cross the seminary product sub F. That's a Frobenius. Now, I'm not going to go into this. It's just how it, how it looks. You see the alternating group. You see some simple groups in here. The ones I want to concentrate on are where the check marks are. If you take log to the base 3, of 20,160 in your computer, and then take the bracket of it, next, next integer above it, you'll get 10. And the same thing happens to M22, one of the mapping groups. You take log to the base 3 of 443520, but you know, the next integer above, you get the K, you get class number 12. Exactly. Those play an important role. So this is, I'm just doing this for variety. Now, what's so special about 14? The special thing about 14 is I asked these authors, I could prove a theorem if you can do 50. 
They said there's no chance in it that we can do 15. Right. This took so much effort. In fact, they're still doing it for me on the computer and still putting it in the frame, you know, for the paper. I want them to put it in a certain framework. That they don't even have this for sure. I mean, they, they have it, they think. So to do 15 is off the charts. There's no chance. Okay, now a little bit of background. A little bit more background. Otherwise it won't get done. I, I'm just gonna have to say, you know what solid groups are? That's my main uh, course of interest. G pi no potent, the, the uh, that's a dry group. No potent. G mod D. For two G subgroup, no potent. That's how they live. These are all solvable. Super solvables imply G prime is no potent, it implies something about the first commutative subgroup. G prime abelian, that's what we call metabelian. It's derived if it's less than or equal to two. I think we've done any group theory we have studied that a little bit. The drive length just means the length of the series, such that the factor groups are abelian. Because I, want, I think I might be running out of time, so I just want you to get now. The important thing for the talk is that you know cyclic, you know, abelian, no potent, and so you're, they're fond of saying, well, the nil potent groups are much more abelian than the abelian groups. That's generally not true. That's generally not true. It depends very much on the prime power of factorization of the order of the group. So, but some nice things to know: if the order of the group is square free then it's automatically metabelian. And if it's only cube free, I mean if it is cube free, I have to add solvability because alternating five is simple, but it, it, it has uh, what? Two squared times, it's divisible by four. So it has, uh, it's cube free. So I have to say solvable. The drive length will turn out to be less than or equal to three. That's good, that's fairly abelian. And the class number will have to be that big. I'm going to go through this very fast because I'm going to lose time if I don't. So there's the background, and some most of you studied this in graduate courses. So there's the solvable factor groups are abelian. Drive the drive groups will work. The drive length is how long it takes you to get down to the identity. You studied all this. Now here's something that has turned out to be very valuable, and that is. And if you knew the drive length was small, d was small, it didn't take you very long, the class number would be bigger than this. And the point is that it's a <clears throat> epsilon, you know, it's a fractional power of the, of the order of the group. And that product, that little thing in parentheses, is always like greater or equal to one, so that's the final thing I'm interested in right now. In particular, if g is metabelian, that is the drive length is two, the exponent one third is best possible. And believe it or not, this took, so I asked, uh, which number three is I asked? Whether you could, you know, there's any way, you know, could you get this into the office as one third with cube congruent to one mile? So you have to do catches with any D and Q. Otherwise, it could be a medium. But if Q is congruent to one, one mod P, you get a uh, non abelian group of derived length two. And that's the group that shows that one third is best possible. So the fact is that all groups of square feet order are metabelian. They're also super solid. So that, that's, that's good, because we know all about those things. Where am I in time? Yeah. OK, we'll move along. Thanks. The main thing to know about no potent groups, this is what's underneath here, is that because the center is not trivial in a no potent group, the class number of G is always bigger than log 2. And that's about the best that can be done. But the no potent groups do it. The only problem is that we don't know whether almost all groups are no potent. That's an outstanding problem. We don't know anything about there are infinite many groups. They happen to be no potent groups of order P and D. With K of P less than the Q group. No collection is known of any groups, no potent or not. 
for the class number less than dog squared. That would be really nice if somebody could prove that or disprove it, that they're either infinite many or not infinite many. OK, here are the definitions again, because I need them in a minute. Pertini, excuse me, the fitting subgroup is a unique non-trivial largest normal no-potent subgroup. The Pertini subgroup is the intersection of all the maximum subgroups. You remember the chart, supersolvability is about halfway up. Every group with all single subgroups cyclic is supersolvable. So every group of square free order is supersolvable. And metabolic, so we're moving up. But a lot of groups are taken care of here. And the square free order, because they're metabolic, I get k of g is bigger than g to the one third. And that's the best I can do but with those. Very difficult thing to This was impossible to improve, but at least you got log two for supersolvability. So we're, we're, we're okay. But I wanted to point out that he didn't do log base three. Why is that important, whether he could do log base three or not? The fundamental problem is this. Does there exist a constant such that A of G is bigger than C log two? For all finite groups, that's the goal. For k less or equal to 14, we're there. In fact, for all g less or equal to 3 to 15, we're there. And the final thing I want to say is where we are. I'm taking the maximum exponent and the prime divisor. When it's square free, those are ones all the way across. I get one third. I get one seventh when it's cube free. So I'm moving along. Okay. So I'm looking at the largest exponent. I will just make a statement here. About 17% of the integers satisfy the largest exponent is at least three. That's from the zeta function. Niven proved. In 1969, that that average order, the average order of Sn, as you go for more and more integers, the average order of S of n, the largest exponent, is 1.7. So the next thing I'm going to say, if you give me a minute, all right. that's the best we can do now. K of g is bigger than log more log log, and nobody can do better for all solvable groups. If we have the fatigue subgroup 1, makes a big difference. I've shown that g is solvable and s is the max and it's greater than equal to 3. Notice we don't need 2 anymore because we have g to the 1 7th or, or g to the 1 3rd we're fine. So I need one and k of g is bigger than equal to this g mod phi of the alpha which is very often happens in fact always. And, and here's one I want to point to the number theorists. If somebody can prove that there exists a fixed epsilon such that for every finite group, the class number is bigger than s to the 1 plus epsilon, that max exponent to the 1 plus epsilon. We are done with the subject. I have some evidence. I'm almost done. When you look at those lists that I gave you before, when k is no more than 14, that epsilon can be replaced by one fifth, and it works for everything. Okay. Now the next statement may shock you. That latter inequality, one, one plus one to the one fifth, well, one, one plus one to the one five, holds among all the nearly 500 billion, 500 billion groups of order no more than 2,000. I don't know if any of you know that sort of thing, but there are huge numbers of groups to examine here. Okay. That's Edmund O'Brien, Australia. I'm working with him to get the data out. And so I proved that if s squared is no more than log g, if this exponent, whenever it is, is no more than square root, it happens very often, okay, we're actually done. In fact, I can get k bigger than log to the t power, whatever t you want. I go bigger. And then I just got uh, last week, because Krishna actually asked me to speak, so I decided to try to prove something new. So last week, if g prime is no potent, so we're moving up, 
above supersolvable, we wiped out that three to the fifth pro three fifths problem. And and I've got this this epsilon. If I know this epsilon, then K of G is bigger than block two when G is sufficiently large, depending only on epsilon. Well, you don't want your epsilon sliding to zero if you're thinking depending on epsilon. This was uh, what I wanted you to all to know at the end. <coughs> Just the top. I didn't know if I had time to prove this or not. When, uh, when I was working, when I was with St. Thomas Krishna, Erdős and Strauss took me aside and said, look, let's work on this. Read it. That's the end I wanted to provide for you. What's the truth? Almost all integers end less than equal x. Satisfy the class number is bigger than g to one minus epsilon. Almost all. With an increasing frequency of n for each group of order. I was going to prove it. It's a number of theory I proved. There's no time. Thank you very much. Um, on one question. Sorry, Alexander, if I took too long. If there are no questions, just thank us for the The next talk starts in three minutes. Listen.